Hey, everybody. Darren's here. Len's here. Roger's here. Jenny has the day off. Just so you know. Don't freak out. She'll be back. Comic-Con flu. <laughs> Len thinks she's a Comic-Con. I'm pretty sure she's not, but who knows? I didn't ship her. I'm not tracking her. Uh, Darren, you ready? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm tracking her right now. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. where, where is she at home? Okay. Uh, yeah. Playing Angry Birds. Here we go. Support for the Daily Tech News Show is provided by patrons like you at patreon.com slash ace detect. This is FPN, the Frog Pants Network. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, July 10th, 2015. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me today, as he does many, many Fridays, Darren Kitchen of Hack5.org, HAK5.org. How's it going, Darren? Uh, so good to be here. I'm so excited. We've got a great lineup of stories. I'm jazzed having wrapped up our first pen test with Hack5 course. And um, I, I, I probably even shouldn't promote the uh, open house barbecue that we're having tomorrow at the warehouse because we already have like 100 people signed up. Because you don't oh, have God. enough meat right now to right. feed <laughs> all those people. Uh, but uh, you know who knows how to cook a good piece of meat? Mm. Len you know, I, know, I know who does. That's right. That's right. That's they call me. Good cooking meat Peralta is what they call Meat me. cooking Peralta. <laughs> the finest meat cooker east of the Mississippi. In all of France, yes. They he puts shame to that kitchen. Uh, Len here to uh, illustrate the show. If you're not familiar, uh, he comes on on Fridays, and whatever topic we're talking about, he draws live during the show uh, and then uh, shares his uh, art with us at the end and makes it available for you to either see and or purchase at the end. So I'm pretty much a superhero is what you're saying. I'm saying that, uh, especially because... Draw. Today, Darren and I are going to, our main discussion is going to be about the cyberpocalypse that happened this week. Like, pretty much everything got hacked or failed. Yes. Uh, and so we've set you a tall task. Well, I feel pretty good about it. Uh, we'll see what it come up with. Who knows? We'll see. We'll see. We will see after the headlines. A person familiar with the matter told Reuters that Samsung will launch its new version of the Galaxy Note in mid-August. Samsung previously has released new Note models in September. Apparently... This is huge news. It was at the top of Google News and Tech Meme. We might get a note a month earlier. The August launch would put the phone on the market ahead of new iPhones. Now, Samsung's annual profit hit a three-year low in 2014, so any move by Samsung is going to be analyzed as some attempt to gain back that market share and increase profits. And I know, Darren, you were an early Note fan. Are you still yes. a Note fan? I have had the Note 1, 2, and 3. Uh, or, let's see... It's the four is the latest, right? We're waiting yeah. on the five? Yeah. yeah. So I skipped the four and got the stupid Nexus. I don't know if I've expressed to you the frustration with the you Nexus. You have, yeah. Okay. But <laughs> anyway, I will be going back uh, as soon as possible. So um, this is good news for you. It is good news for me. And you know what? I, I should also point out that it was uh, on the front page of so many places, including peoplefamiliarwiththematter.com. Uh, it was uh, right there in a story with futures, with stock futures soaring, with PC, PC purchasing declining, and oil prices could fall, and then some mention of the Samsung thing. So it's good to see that uh, you know they're on top of it over there. People familiar with the matter dot com, you say? Are you are you really looking at it? Is it really there? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I just linked it in chat, and uh, yeah, it's all over. No kidding. Uh, yeah. Wow, that site still runs. You don't have to do much. It just no, runs. No, you know sometimes. Sometimes, Tom, you can just set and forget technology. Other times, it may need a little bit more maintenance. Uh, is this yeah. a WordPress site? We should talk about what plugins you've got going. Maybe uh, mm. it's time for uh, we should talk when we're not live on the air, actually. Yeah. TechCrunch reports Microsoft's Power by Cloud Business Intelligence Service will become generally available July 24th. Power by tries to make it easy for anyone in a company to visualize data and generate reports using a browser. The service can pull data together from many services, GitHub, Google Analytics, Twilio, Salesforce, QuickBooks, a whole lot more. Microsoft has also decided to open source the library that powers the service's visualizations. A free tier of the service limits you to a gigabyte per user and 10,000 rows of data per hour and the paid service is $10 per user per month with a 10 gigabyte and million row per hour limit. 
Yeah, this looks a lot hotter than the open source data tables. Um, have you played with any of these online services to uh, visualize data like this? You know, I haven't. And none, none of these new, like, self-hosted cloud-based services. I haven't had a chance to, to mess with those. They're cool? Yeah, I, I tried Splunk. And, you know, maybe I just, uh, it, the, well, okay, so I'll just admit it. The learning curve is really high for these. And so I'm looking at the marketing material from Microsoft on this, and I'm like, wow. That looks easy the way that it integrates with the Salesforces and the Google Analytics and the you know other platforms. So I don't know. I I think I might give it a shot. It looks pretty cool. I, yeah. I definitely like the idea. I mean I'm I'm looking for visualization engines for data, and that looks like a good one. And and pretty much any employee that has the permission to access the source data can use a browser to access the stuff, as I understand. And then there's a desktop tool if you want to get like serious about your analytics. Uh, so it does seem pretty cool. Hey, if you do try it out, let us know. I'd be curious. BBC reports the U.S. Director of the Office of Personnel Management, Catherine Archuleta, has resigned in the aftermath of the Office of Personnel Management data breach. More than 20 million records were accessed by attackers, uh, and this will do nothing to change that fact or future security. But when bad things happen, the head takes the fall, right? Yeah, in fact, actually, it was just yesterday that she was saying that she wasn't going to resign. She said, quote, we are working very hard, not only at OPM, but across government to ensure the cybersecurity of all of our systems, and I will continue to do so. She continued to do so for about 24 hours. Yeah. Uh, Gadget reports BlackBerry and Google announced BES 12 now supports Android 5.0 Lollipop and Google Play for work. That means BlackBerry security features now integrated into Android in the enterprise. Uh, you know, you can make more of this than it is, but it's Google and BlackBerry integrating BlackBerry Enterprise Service into Android, so it's not nothing. Uh, called it years ago, right? Did we not? Totally, uh, totally. We well, well, I don't know if I would say I called it. I said okay. this is a really good idea. They should do that, and I'm glad. Well, and I, they are. I was just thinking about a, a, a tech. I was just thinking about a prediction show that I was on with you. It had a different acronym. It was years ago. But, oh, really? Uh, I mentioned something to this effect. Yes. Oh, okay. So there you go. Called it. Yeah. But definitely, this will I hope reinvigorate BlackBerry because I don't want to see them die. But you know. Lots of platforms. Here's the thing. BlackBerry is good at two things, uh, enterprise management and keyboards. So this is the enterprise management part surviving. Maybe they could just like be a third-party keyboard manufacturer. They are know. the Model M of the mobile industry. They are kind of are, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's why they're suing Ryan Seacrest. Oh. And Gadget passes along the Korean Electronic Times report that Samsung is leading a team of 13 companies in an attempt to develop an 11K mobile display by 2018. You heard me right, 11K, a 2250 pixel per inch display. Why? Hold on before you just say marketing hype, because I'm sure that's part of it. Samsung says that that amount of pixels could allow 3D effects without glasses. So... I pull back from saying it's all just marketing hype. If they can pull that off, that would be interesting. South Korean government is even pitching in $26.5 million over five years to help out the project. But they didn't, though, say they, you know, they, they talked about 11K, but they didn't say the size of the screen, did they? Uh, no. Why? You think it's going to be like postage stamp size or something? Yeah, what a, what a, no, I guess they, you could just reverse it from the 2250 <laughs> PPI. But I just, I would like to imagine that somewhere there is an 11K display with each pixel being like the size of your head. So you can have that old school Pong moment. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, Reuters reports ZTE and SoftBank will deploy a pre 5G commercial trial in Japan early next year. Also, part marketing hype, part something worth paying attention to. It's a stepping stone to 5G that ZTE describes as using core 5G technologies, but on existing 4G networks in order to deliver higher speeds. Might be majority marketing hype, I can't really tell, but it is definitely ZTE working uh, with SoftBank to get people used to 5G, and I'll give them credit for not calling it 5G, even though it's not. Right. I mean, 5G, we're told, is supposed to be rolling out 2020 if the you know, uh, groups that put these kind of specifications are to, uh, together to be trusted. Uh, the idea here is you know, tens of megabytes per second, but what I think is really interesting about some of the changes in the protocol is that, uh, well, you know, proposed uh, 
uh, achievement would be that several hundreds of thousands of simultaneous connections would be supported for like massive sensor deployments. So think Internet of Things, you know, low latency, low bandwidth, uh, but being able to track that many devices. Sounds pretty rad. Yeah. Uh, ZDNet has Gartner's latest report showing PC sales had their worst decline in two years during Q2. 68.4 million PCs shipped worldwide, down 9.5% year over year. In the U.S., PC shipments declined 5.8%. Gartner cited the dollar's high value, uh, vendors clearing out inventory ahead of Windows 10 launch, and a lack of reasons to refresh or upgrade in general as the problems. Analysts believe the market should see growth again next year. Th these aren't necessarily surprising, right, Darren? Well, okay, I mean, do you think it's attributed to Microsoft and Windows mainly? I mean, at this point, PC is a very mature market. People mm -hmm. are not going to upgrade and refresh uh, computers unless they need to. And, and with hardware lasting longer, you know, you don't need a new processor every year uh, to keep up. There's just, there's just not going to be a need to constantly refresh PCs. And so the only reason to refresh is if you're a couple of versions behind on Windows and a new version of Windows comes out. So I do think we'll continue to see a spike when new versions of Windows come out. But keep in mind, Microsoft's new plan is to just do Windows as a service. Yeah, so... so where does that spike go? Does it just get distributed? Does it get spread out? May and maybe that's good for the PC market. I don't know. It's very good for, for a few markets indeed. Like, think of this. This is actually an opportunity, really. Uh, it used to be the old adage that what Intel giveth, Microsoft taketh away, right? The whole right. idea that you would have to upgrade every two years, every year, because, you know, if you wanted the latest, you know, version of Windows, right? But they're they're, now each version of Windows is so long in the tooth as far as like how, you know, how frequently they come out and how much more CPU they, they take from the previous versions. And I feel like you know, we've been saying year after year, similar to Spectacle, Spectacle Fest, this will be the year for Linux on the desktop. And I'm pointing at you, Wayland developers. I know you're working on that new alternative to X11, and you should just bloat the crap out of it so that we'll have a, an excuse to buy new PCs. And then finally, Linux will be the one because all of the manufacturers will be like, oh, yeah, no, let's put that new Linux thing on our computers because it, it really taxes the system. It's a rev. I, I, you're absolutely right. Linux has been playing the game all wrong all these years no, by trying to be no. damn small no. Linux, totally the wrong direction. Yeah. They're you like, need we'll really big, it. huge Linux. Mm -hmm. And then people will go for it in droves. I mean, people uh, are into big data, so they should be into big OS. Like, why should it be limited to like a 4.7 gig DVD ISO? Like, give us the 10 terabyte OS Linux. I do. Th I do think, though, that uh, we will see it, we will see an interesting effect on the PC market as Windows becomes less of a big deal, uh, and and I mean that both in the fact that there won't be like a Windows 11 launch if if right. if the plans are true, uh, but also the operating system kind of slowly fading into the background. And I don't think that oh. means Microsoft dies. I, I I think whether you have Windows or Mac or Android or Windows Phone or BlackBerry OS is becoming less relevant over time. Which is good, which is good for the con consumer. And uh, I mean, remember, there was a time when Microsoft made a version of Internet Explorer for Mac, right? Did they still do that? The, uh, no, they, they no. haven't made Internet Explorer for Mac for a long time. What, the question is, are they going to make uh, the new browser right. for Mac? Spartan. Yeah. If Spartan, now just think, like how is would that, that, how amazing would that be? Spartan for Linux. Of course, you know, I know those Arch guys wouldn't run it, but you know those Ubuntu people would. Uh, well, it's not called Project Spartan anymore. So, oh. you, so play play this uh, you know, edge for Linux. It, it's it's Metro. It's not Metro. It's Spartan. It's not Spartan. <laughs> it was I, Project I, Spartan though. That was a code name. I'll give them that. That's like saying Longhorn, and then it's like, oh well, it's Windows XP. So I'm still calling it Chicago. Was Longhorn Windows XP. Okay. Yeah, I think it was. <laughs> oh, uh, I don't know how I know, know this, but breaking news: people familiar with the Matter.com is a fully updated uh, WordPress installation. Oh, thank you. ZDNet has, gar oh, I'm sorry, Engadget reports Bangalore, India's police chief MN Reddit wants citizens to use Periscope to capture footage of crimes in action to help police. Eventually, the organization would like to use a police control room to monitor Periscope and find the location of crimes and alert the appropriate jurisdictional police. Police plan on broadcasting press conferences over press Periscope as well. 
I, I, I don't know. I just love this story of, of a law enforcement agency kind of getting it and going, oh, yeah, let's not be afraid of cameras. Uh, this could totally help us out. Let's figure out ways that it can. No, no, you're absolutely right. I love the idea of them embracing technology. I just see so many abuses for it as far as like ways to troll law enforcement. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, and, and that is always going, that's always the problem, right? This does, right. anytime you open up another avenue of communication, you open up another avenue for swatting. Right, right. So it's like, oh, we're going to pull a job over here. So quick, let's stage something over there. Um, yeah, I, I would like to see, Anyway, I don't want to go down that. There's an, just look up the ACLU app. I'll paste it in the channel. Yeah. Longhorn was Vista, by the way. I knew I had that. Uh, but yeah, I'm, well, all I would say is like, dear Bangalore Police uh, Department, take Darren's warning to heart and be, you know, try to take measures uh, to, to help mitigate those kinds of instances. There's no reason not to do it. Yeah, it's like one of those, if you see something, say something, things that can get like totally out of hand when you empower citizens with those kinds of things to rat out their neighbors and stuff with video, it can, I, I don't yeah. know. I see, no, you don't I want see, to encourage like, that. There's, there's one thing to say, like, I, I see a, you know, I, I see a, a pickpocket in progress and there it goes versus like, I am going to go like break into my neighbor's property and try to catch him doing something because I don't like him. Yeah. Sure. Let's uh, take some news from you. We already have. Can you identify which of the headlines we've read already that were news from you on the subreddit? Go to dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com to find out. The Coralie submitted the R&D mag write-up on a new material that may be as promising as graphene. It's called black arsenic phosphorus. Chemists at the Technical University Munich have developed a semiconducting material which replaces individual phosphorus atoms with arsenic. And colleagues in the U.S. at USC and Yale built the first field effect transistors from the material. It can detect long wavelength radiation like LIDAR, can be peeled off in ultra-thin layers for flexible computing, unlike graphene. Uh, it's, it's a semiconductor right out of the gate, so to speak. Uh, so it would be possible to put a black arsenic phosphorus semiconductor in old lace. That's one for all the semiconductor fans who are also fans of the plays of Joseph Kesselring. It's good Which stuff. Is, yeah, bring it. Not, there's none of those. Motang submitted the ZDNet story that Google is using its artificial neural network to detect and block spam. Uh, it uses machine learning. Uh, the system tracks usage patterns, detects email impersonation, where an email purports to come from one sender when it actually comes from another. Google also announced new Gmail Postmaster tools to help qualified high volume senders analyze their email data, including delivery errors, spam reports, and reputation. So <laughs> it almost sounds like they're helping the spammers and they're hurting the spammers. But I guess the idea is the people they're trying to help are, are whitelisted folks who follow the rules and only send mail to people who have asked for it. This just sounds insane. And I know that it's not that much more insane than, say, Spam Assassin 10 years ago. But it's kind of crazy to think about this. I mean, the technology, don't get me wrong, is really cool. The machine learning and all of that crazy stuff. But it's like feels like such a weird workaround patch to a technology that, like, an archaic technology that probably should have been overhauled, like, years ago because we're all dependent on it. Maybe added some features for, like, privacy and authentication. Because when this story begins with all, like, uh, you know, mail being, you know, impersonated, uh, it just reminds me of, like, being a teenager telnetting into an SMTP server for the first time and sending email to yourself from, you know, Bill Gates at Microsoft.com and realizing it works. <laughs> yeah, I know. The first time you ever realize that you can just spoof any email address you want, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a revelation. Like, who thought this was okay? To who allow? thought this was a great idea? And, it, yeah. and, you know, it was a great idea at the time when everybody knew. It's like, oh, well, that's, you know, obviously that wasn't Bob because, you know, Bob's on vacation because, you know, there's only one Bob on the Internet. And we all um, read all the headers, and we can see that it's not originating at that server. Obviously. Yeah, I mean, the one server that exists. So th this is just, I don't know, part of it is just like, wow, we have so many alternatives to email that have so much better, uh, you know, more robust protocols, and, and yet crazy machine learning is being used yeah. to keep the old one kicking. The same thing that, that powers Google now to tell you what restaurant you might like is also trying to fight spam. 
I love SP it. Sheridan submitted the Tornfried article that Pirate Bay co-founders Gottfried Svartholm, Friedrich Nietzsche, Peter Sund, and Carl Lundstrom have been acquitted of criminal copyright and abuse of electronic communication charges by a court in Belgium. All four deny any involvement with the Pirate Bay after its sale to a Seychelles-based company in 2006. The case alleged that the four had involvement between September 2011 and November 2013. The judge ruled that the involvement of the four co-founders could not be proven. So it's out of court. At least they, they got away from this one this time. And in fact, Oliver Metterlink, director of the Belgian Entertainment Association that brought the case, was quoted saying, technically speaking, we agree with the court. Why was this in court in the first place then? Hmm. Uh, and that is a look at the headlines. All right, this was a hell of a week. Uh, we have, as we mentioned, Catherine Archuleta stepping down after a revelation that more than 20 million records were accessed by attackers at the Office of Personnel Management in the United States. Uh, we have the fact that 400 gigabytes of data from the hacking team surveillance firm uh, has been publicly disclosed. Uh, we have a router issue grounding United Airlines flights for two hours on Wednesday. We have the New York Stock Exchange and many Bane joke memes created uh, as the New York Stock Exchange goes down for three hours, 38 minutes Wednesday due to a gateway error related to a software rollout that went wrong. Uh, we have the Nigerian Communications Commission seeking the right to intercept calls in Nigeria. We have FBI Director James Comey testifying to the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee uh, that terrorist groups using encryption are hiding recruitment efforts and kill orders. And then we have 14 cryptographers publishing a paper arguing that, hey, you know what, though? Giving special access to encrypted communication puts data and infrastructure in peril. New York Stock Exchange goes down. United Airlines grounded. Everyone getting hacked. Darren, is this the cyberpocalypse? It is. It is the end, Tom. And oh, well. why <laughs> Quick I'm answer. I don't know. We're out of here. Uh, yes. No, I mean, are things really getting worse? Are we headed for some kind of cybergeddon, as, as many outlets are saying? Or is this just the world becoming more aware of what's already been going on for decades? Well, we should probably consider that in the past we weren't as well equipped to detect, you know, data breaches that are happening more and more. I'm not saying that they aren't. You know, nobody's disputing that since it's being tracked that they haven't been on the rise. But you consider kind of like the change in the uh, vulnerability of the software. We were just joking around about, you know, Windows 95 and Vista and such. And so you think about uh, our capabilities to detect these threats as opposed to how vulnerable we were versus how, you know, generally speaking, software and, and, and concepts of building secure systems have gotten better, uh, and yet it seems to be reported on more. So I guess it, the, the question is, like, this has probably been going on for quite some time. Uh, you know, there's the, the uh, what is it, the largest data breach or the, the largest cyber attack on, on the U.S. government um, that we were just talking about. The and Office of wonder, like, yeah. Right, and it makes me wonder, like, is it really? <laughs> it's the largest one we know about. Exactly. Uh, no, it's, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, if an intelligence agency had an attack like this, would we know about it? Probably not. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other thing, as far as, like, those other systems going down, you know, yes, NYSE going down, uh, United Airlines having to ground their flights because of computer systems, uh, it's... Uh, Okay, so, every, so the, the reports that have come out from both of those are like, no, it's not cyber attacks, don't worry, it's just regular glitches. And you would wonder if, in fact, this was a cyber attack, then somebody would be using it to try to further their, like, agenda of cyber terrorism. Someone would be claiming responsibility, is that what you're saying? Not even just claiming responsibility, but you would see politicians using this to say, like, this is why we need an anti-encryption laws and things of that. Uh, so you can kind of imagine if systems like this are already this complex to just manage today, uh, how much more complex it would be if you had to sort of, like, you know, heed to the government as far as their uh, requests for backdoors and things of that nature are. I think, actually, in, in some cases, this is kind of an example of how graceful degradation needs to be implemented across these systems. That is the concept that, you know, the computer network or the machine uh, would still maintain some sort of limited functionality even when a large portion of it has been rendered inoperative. Um, and you can kind of think of it like if you pulled up Google.com right now and you disabled JavaScript, it would still work. If mm -hmm. you disabled CSS, it wouldn't look as good, but it would still work. 
Yeah, uh, with no script we, running in my Firefox installation, I can use Google without having to give any additional permissions. That's not true of a lot of websites. Right. And, and, it, and in this case, not very true of United with their ability to maintain you know, regular operations without... So, so it just shows some of the dependence on this. Um, it's, to me, let's, let's talk specifically about United and the New York Times. And I think Darren and I are both going to believe those organizations when they say that it wasn't a hack, that it was software failure, because it's perfectly believable, right? We are seeing a problem of scale, I think. Uh, we, we've talked about this previously on the show regarding video game rollouts and how no video game rollout ever goes smoothly. In fact, before the show, we were talking about the new Arkham game and how it had problems on the PC. You know, the SimCity rollout famously uh, was a problem. Any connected cloud-based game has problems. It's no surprise that other internet connected things uh, you know like a united airlines booking system where you can check in over the web is going to have problems as the scale gets larger and larger i feel like it's just kind of a principle of computing i mean you think about it darren when you when you create a piece of software that's meant to be used by a lot of people on the internet you can do as much load testing as you want you never know where the weaknesses are until you make it live Right. No, I, I absolutely know. We just launched or soft launched the, the Land Turtle with our Pentest with Act 5 course, and I was getting immediate feedback from students like, oh, that's kind of needs to be fixed before we go live, you know, uh, and it will continue to be so, which is why it's open source and why people can contribute to it and stuff like that. But of course, the same is not true for systems from NYSE or from, um, um, from United, obviously. And as a systems administrator, I can. I, you know, absolutely sympathize and recognize the, the difficulty in maintaining those systems. It's just that, you know, if, if my network goes down, like, oh, some people can't get a podcast. If their network goes down, it really inconveniences the world. It's, it's, it, it slows world trade, uh, which is, yeah, it's, a, it's a, a bigger impact. I think it's showing, though, that we hadn't really penetrated the entire world with internet-connected computing until now. With this, and that this is what you would expect to see. The same sort of things that brought down AOL or that make a website going down. WallStreetJournal.com went down for a short period of time, same day as United and New York Times. And the only reason people really noticed was because it happened at the same time as those other two. Websites go down all the time for various reasons, right? Uh, right. So I, I think there's that side of it, which is like we're going to see these sorts of things happen. Glitches happen that affect more people because the internet and computing is affecting more people and being used in more places. That's just a matter of percentages. And we will get better at that as we get more used to operating at that scale. The other side is the hacking, though. I mean, the, gov the GAO uh, here in the U.S. reports that incidents against the government rose 35% from 2010 to 2013. The Ponemon Institute study sponsored by IBM says the average cost of a data breach has risen 23% since 2013, that seems to imply that maybe overall total attacks aren't going up, but the attacks are getting focused and they're getting more costly. Right. No, absolutely. I mean, like we said, like the complexity has gotten so much more and the systems are built with security in mind. So, you know, it's not as easy as it used to be. I was joking around about sending emails from Bill Gates. Like, yeah, you can still do that. But, you know, Google's heuristic system is going to identify it and be like, yeah, you ain't Bill. So... Um, so, so if somebody's out there freaking out saying, like, I, I think Cybergeddon's coming, it's all going to fall apart. Well, it's going to fall apart regardless of hackers. Every system will fail. So the thing is, build it in such a way that when it does, because it's not an if, it's a when it does, that there is still some, you know, something in place to, to have it working in some sort of capacity. That's an interesting way of thinking about it. The, attack, the malicious attackers... And the software no, glitches exactly. and the network errors and the no, load exactly. testing errors. Yeah. You they're, need all, to they're all a category of things you have to anticipate and be ready to deal with. Right. No, it's the same thing. Like, I don't care if it's hackers from DPRK or a, uh, or a tsunami. You know, the, the electric grid needs to, you know, work in some sort of capacity. And when it doesn't, you need to have things in place to get things back up and rolling. So uh, it's just another vector, right? It's, it's, it's another it's reason... Like, that you need to be really nice to your local sysadmin. Right. <laughs> right. You want to you get into some of these uh, backdoor things, though? Because I thought I was kind of creeped out by one of the statements from the uh, Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates uh, recently speaking uh, about 
basically, you know, the Fed's wanting uh, backdoor access to, you know, the say the encrypted data on your phone or social networks and things of that I nature. I would like the 14 most preeminent cryptographers in the world publishing a paper saying why that's a bad, uh, a bad idea to be the last word on it. I don't think I'm going to get my wish, though. No, you won't. And you know what's really creepy here is actually the, the statement that um, that Sally Yates said that uh, they're working directly with Silicon Valley companies to forge, quote, uh, individualized solutions. And that they're, quote, uh, not ruling out a legislative solution. I want a legislative solution, a.k.a. let's legislate that breaking crypto in, uh, on purpose and putting in backdoors is bad. I want that sort of things on the book. What creeps me out is the whole idea of like, oh yeah, we're making backroom deals. And it reminds me of things that we learned from you know, Edward Snowden's leaks, where, for instance, Outlook.com's encryption was uh, Microsoft uh, happened to work with the FBI on the backdoor for that. So it's, it's, that's what really creeps me out. Because yes, you're right, these, these security experts have written some amazing stuff uh, on the subject, it's it's like crypto wars from the 90s all over again. But essentially, this time, what uh, law enforcement is looking to get is what they call exceptional access. That's where by there's not a traditional backdoor where you know you just let us see everything. There's a set of keys, and you hold some keys, and we hold some keys, and only when all of those keys come together uh, is is law enforcement able to access the system. All of this rests on the presumption that the bad actors will use that encryption technology that has the keys, which they won't. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so it's like, if I'm, you know, <laughs> if I'm a crazy terrorist, am I going to use the backdoored iPhone? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I mean, sure, I guess they could make a secret deal with somebody, but even then, there's, there's plenty of projects and encryption plans that they can create on their own that, that don't have the secret keys built into them. So it's, it's kind of an uphill fight. And Director Comey, in his, in his testimony, did say that they have been able to make progress against bad actors and, and, and capture them and capture intelligence without having to have backdoor access. Uh, he, right. he did at least admit that, and I, I think that's important to note. Yeah, and it's also important to note that the exceptional access, the whole, the whole thing is just flawed on so many fundamental levels that it would like actually take us back to the Stone Ages where we're actually progressing forward right now with things like forward secrecy and authenticated encryption, and things like that. Uh, and just, it's unfathomable the kind of cost and complexity adding such a system would be. And then you think about, hey, like, Here's a system like the NYSE or United that just try, just struggling to keep things going on a regular basis, add backdoors, and then it gets even more complex and scary. And then, of course, the, the single most uh, you know, terrifying thing is like, oh, so wait, you're saying that there are just these you know, couple of keys we need to get? We're the bad actors and we want access to everybody's, uh, everybody's stuff. We just have to get those things? Cool. Got yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a big, big fat target. Um, mm-hmm. All right, let's 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 lighten the mood a little. Let's have some music. Let's have some Turkish dance music, Darren. Yes, and cats. Uh, sure. This yeah. yeah, this uh this one was sent in uh for uh, our pick of the day. Uh, listening to the show twenty five thirty three. The topic was curated playlists. My favorite online radio station is Dynamo FM. That's D I. N-A-M-O dot F-M. The station is a real FM station in Istanbul playing electronic music ranging from quality electronic music to avant-garde to mainstream syndicated programs. In the wee hours Istanbul time, the legacy station gets weird and you'll hear Ornette Coleman via crazy jazzy programs or maybe space music. Did I mention that they show they run several online channels for different electronic music verticals? I've been listening to Dynamo FM since their inception and always return after my current music service runs stale, as is the case with Rhapsody, Pandora, Spotify, Groove Shark, and my own music collection. The ads should catch, should you catch any, are in Turkish, so they don't, they don't bother them nearly as much as ones that are English. Uh, and they have phone apps, too. So if you're a fan of electronic music, especially European curation of indie and mainstream sounds, this is a go-to station at Dynamo FM, D I. N A M O F M, uh, and I I didn't I forgot to copy over the name of the person who sent this. Mark, thank you, Mark, for sending. You it. know, Mark might also like D I F M, which is short for digitally imported. Very similar. It's good techno stuff. They got like forty channels of 
all sorts of electronica as well. So put them both on. Yeah, send your picks to us too. Uh, not just radio picks, picks for anything. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. My picks are at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. All right, let's plow through these messages of the day. Pete from sunny Florida posting on our blog said, hey, regarding those curated playlists in music, I doubt they'll work better than algorithmic playlists. The real reason for them is payola. I believe the producers put their favorite pet project on the top of everybody's lists. Google puts sponsored links on the top of search results, but at least those are clearly marked. Your playlists are going to be full of music you're supposed to be listening to, not what you like. It's all money, Darren. Forget curation. Sure. It's all money. Forget curation. <laughs> uh I actually think that, you know what, it's not unlikely, Pete, that maybe something like that happens, but I don't think it happens nearly as much as you're talking about. And there are plenty of curated stations out there like Dynamo FM, uh, like Soma FM, like DI, that, uh, was it, DI.FM? Yeah, DI.FM. Uh, uh, that aren't subject to those pressures. That I, I think the point is still good that curated playlists sometimes can be good and, and expose you to music that you would not otherwise have noticed. Uh, Rich from lovely Cleveland thinks we've seen an emergence in the middle ground between just algorithmic curation and having some sort of direct human oversight. He writes, I could see IBM's Watson used on something like music curation. Instead of scanning encyclopedias and medical journals, it would linguistically parse Pitchfork and Rolling Stone, building up a semantic relationship in the language of the reviews and using that to serve up relevant content. Much as it's already done for medicine and food, it could draw on what people have already produced on a topic, but would be able to create relationships that are perhaps non-obvious. And then it creates relationships between the music you're listening to and your current health. You've got the Fitbit that's communicating with your iPhone, telling you what music to play based Oh, it's, it gets crazy. Thank you, Watson. Uh, and then Howard from South Jersey uh, wrote in in regards to the release of Microsoft Office for Mac. He says... I'm conflicted whether to become an Office 365 subscriber or to wait for the boxed copy. Given that it's been five years since the last significant update, I'm concerned that the monthly subscription will be much more expensive without any particular benefit over the boxed copy. I've been very pleased with Adobe's Creative Cloud subscription, which has proven time and again that the monthly subscription brings more features and more access to the tools. But Adobe has traditionally kept Mac and PC versions on par. Do you think that such a mania will bring that consistent innovation to the Mac version of Office, or will it be another five years between significant updates? Well, uh, I think if, if, that's, your, if you, that's your argument against like, innovation uh, on Microsoft Office, then you're probably better off with OpenOffice anyway, because you just needed Word and Excel or yeah. their direct equivalents. Uh, and and there, there may be places where uh, certain spreadsheets created in Excel don't open very well in OpenOffice in your particular workplace, and I, I can see that being an exception, but you're right. Uh, if you just want freedom uh, fr from all those restrictions, then go open or go LibreOffice uh, yeah. and, 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 and be able to do stuff that way. I, I do think that I had not thought about the, the single-use scenario for Office 365. I feel like the box case is still better if for some reason you have to get Microsoft Office, whereas the subscription is good if you're like, hey, you know what? I need to install this on like five different machines in my family, uh, and this saves me money over the long term, then it's probably worth it without having to break the law. Finally, Jeremy writes in and says, uh, you may or may not have heard of Vote. V-O-A-T. Uh, a lot of people are writing it up now because people upset with Reddit are going there and using vote. Uh, anyway, Jeremy says, I created a vote subverse for Daily Tech News Show. Uh, I just wanted to help out and grab it. If you'd like to claim it or become a moderator, let me know. I'd be willing to help out. Uh, I just wanted to grab it before anybody else did. It's voat.co slash v slash Daily Tech News Show. Uh, he said, I'll try to grab frog pants for Scott, too. Thank you, Jeremy, for doing that. Uh, that's actually how the Daily Tech News Show subreddit happened, is Scotty Rowland just made it, uh, which is fantastic, and does a great job continuing to help run it, along with Kyle and Seb Gons and Tom Gerke and, and others uh, that joined in as well. Uh, so if you're interested in helping Jeremy out with the vote, there it is, V-O-A-T dot com slash V slash Daily Tech News Show. I threw a couple links in there so it didn't look so uh, abandoned. Have you heard about Vote much, Darren? No, I haven't. I'm checking it out now, and it just looks like they completely forked Reddit. <laughs> yeah. 
They yeah. did. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a whatever Reddit code is available publicly uh, seems to have been used there. I may be wrong about that, but that's what it looks like for sure. Wow. Uh, I don't, I'm cool. not uh, necessarily going to use it to replace the subreddit uh, because the subreddit has so much momentum and people know to go there. But I'm also not against experimenting and seeing like, well, maybe it's good for something else. Or if, the, you know, if Reddit collapses, which I don't expect, at least we've got this as a backup. So really appreciate Jeremy doing that. Experimenting is good. I mean, some yeah. of us did well in college. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Darren. Uh, HAK5.org is the place. Uh, you had your big uh, pen testing course last week. I know it went well, uh, and I'm glad to hear that. What, what else is going on? Oh, man. Let's see. We're doing, let's see. Shannon just did a thing on packet sniffing with Android. I'm looking at, uh, we're doing this whole series on virtualization. So if you're interested in building, like, uh, you know, recycling that spare computer in the closet and turning it into a VM server where you can try out a bunch of different operating systems and blow them up and build them again, uh, check it out. We've been covering Citrix Zen Server. And uh, Threatwire is doing Epic, as well as Metasploit Minute Hack Tip, Tech Thing, and uh, all sorts of new fun good things coming to hak5.org. Uh, if you're in the Bay Area and you want to uh, come hang out with us at the warehouse tomorrow, we're having a little open house, uh, hack5.org slash open house. Check it out. Len Peralta. My God, Len, this may be the most beautiful, awe-inspiring <laughs> thing you've done yet. This is crazy. <laughs> I don't know how awe-inspiring it is. It's just it's sort pretty of pretty awe-inspiring to me. <laughs> it's sort of a, a reaction to all the news from this week. I, you know, I saw the uh, Cyber Geddon, and I didn't really think I could make a real good joke about it. So I just decided to do something that was a little bit darker. Yeah, you're right. This isn't funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's not funny. This guy's a little bit darker. Yeah, it's got some dark tones to it. It's good though. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's uh, it's an interesting little piece of a uh, of what I think a cyber geddon uh, uh, dweller might look like. Uh, is that the is that the like oh, pineapple he's a survivor of the, of the future? Geddon. Yeah, that too, a survivor too. Well, oh. survivor, whatever. You know, he's going to be battling it out. Yeah, I you know the the tech here is sort of funny because there's all kinds of like wires, and of course he's got like the the. <laughs> I thought about it afterwards. He's got the, the Wi-Fi in the front of his gun, but, but why the wires? But then, you know, hey, man, he's his own self-contained, uh, 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 you know, hotspot or something. <laughs> I just assumed that was the Wi-Fi pineapple Mark 1000. Right. Yeah, you got to use the Mark 1000 against Skynet or you, you're yeah. not going to have a chance. Um, I need to know his name because ultimately what I want to do is see him show down with Quanto from the very first DTNS <laughs> Friday art. The, oh, you know, I don't know. You know, D Darren, I'm I'm gonna give you a full uh, 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 opportunity to uh, to name him because I, I I'm not good at that. Because I think they need to go side by side and like dance toe to toe. Him and Quanto. <laughs> now that's something I'd like to see. Maybe a Dragon Con. That'd be cool. I don't know what to call him. Squimpy. Mm. Squimpy. You know, we could, we could definitely get uh, uh, Bang S. In, uh, in IRC to help with that. All right, yeah. yeah. We'll do, sure. we'll do some manual. Uh, if you want to take a look at it too, lenperaltastore.com uh, yeah. is the place to go. And of course, if you're a Patreon supporter of Len, uh, you can get it even easier. Yes, patreon.com forward slash Len. And thank you to our patrons uh, who support the show and make it possible for us to continue to do it. Uh, your, your value is... Uh, of the show is what allows us to give you value back. The more you value the show, the more value we endeavor to return to you. Uh, so help us out if you can. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash support. Give as little or as the We Have Concerns guys say, give as much. You know, there's no limit to <laughs> what you could give. If you, if you have a lot to spare, we'd be happy to have it. Uh, but you don't, don't feel like you have to. Uh, it's, it's all whatever you feel is appropriate. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash support. And don't forget, if you're going to Nerdtacular and you're interested in the new Nerdtacular edition of the DTNS shirt, which has all of our names on it, spelling out Nerdtacular, you can get that at dailytechnewsshow.com slash store and use the code two sides to avoid paying for shipping and just pick it up in Salt Lake City when you're at Nerdtacular. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Use it. Call us, 51259-DAILY. Listen to the show live Monday through Friday, 4.30 Eastern at player.alphageekradio.com and visit our website, dailytechnewsshow.com. We'll be back on Monday with Patrick Beja on Monday, along with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. The show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more 
at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Great show. What should we call it? Yay. This display goes up to 11K. <laughs> Dynamo.fm, not Constantinople. <laughs> and dot 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 times dot dot dot. Uh, it is the only enterprise Android I know. Huh. It's not 5G. Up Periscope, mm. down Crime. <laughs> I don't know. I should start editing the show. You guys kick those around. All right. Um, it's not 5G. Well, if it isn't, then what is it? It's pre-5G. Uh, CSI Cybergeddon. CSI Cybergeddon's not bad. Yeah, pay no attention to the data breaches behind the curtain. We're going to need a bigger OS. <laughs> nice. Definitely. In fact, you know, what would be great is you've got all that source code you know, open source community. Just like, I don't know, download, uh, clone everything on GitHub, <laughs> all of the source, and just put it into one giant ISO. I want to see, like, who can make the largest Linux distro. Like, <laughs> the one that doesn't even need a repository because it's all just baked in. Well, you want to do a piece of software? It's well, all in there. It here. It's Let's in there. It. We'll call it Wait, Prego it Linux. <laughs> you include the source to everything because it's bigger. <laughs> Uh, I, wait. Like, I like the display goes up to 11K. It's yeah. Big, big, go big Linux or go home. Mm, end times. Dynamo.fm. Not Constant Constantinople. Hmm. Who's breathing? I think it's Roger. Darth Sorry. Roger. We're all breathing. <laughs> We're all breathing, Tom. But I like the. Oh floor. crap! Uh, mm. We have a little breaking news here. Breaking news. Yeah. It is. In fact, I should probably record this as a post thing and put it in the uh, put it well, in the main it, show. It, it post is already. Ellen Pow stepping down as Reddit CEO. Wow. Pow said the departure was a mutual decision with the board, due in part to different views on growth potential. They had a more aggressive view than I did, she said. Hmm. Interesting. Well, maybe that will spur more voters, or whatever they will be called. <laughs> V-O-A-T. Well, or, or no, actually, it would be or, the opposite, because the, the, the yeah. protesters were all wanting her to go, so. Yeah, right. You know, it's, it's when you're running a platform for the people, you got to go with the will of the people. It's almost like democracy or something. I don't know. Where did she come from? Like, wasn't she from somewhere else? Yeah, she was from the financial world. Okay. Investment. It's like, it's almost like the CEO is a uh, sort of president of some uh, nation state that doesn't exist in meat space, of course, but in cyberspace. And, uh, you know, when all of your citizens really don't like your president, um, sometimes you step down. Sometimes you get impeached. She says oh. she resigned. Uh, uh, Altman, which 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 Altman is this? Sam Altman of Y Combinator uh, said that Ellen did an incredible job. Uh, it came into a situation she did and was dropped into a crucible. Um, and who is coming back? Huffman is coming back as CEO. Steve Huffman, Huffman, the uh, co-founder. Hmm. is taking over immediately. She did a wonderful job of deleting subreddits. and uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, Victoria Taylor uh, said she did a great job firing me. <laughs> uh, Does this explain why all my subreddits have gone mute? Hmm. <laughs> have they? Again? Uh, I'm, I'm, no. I'm oh, just okay. I'm mentioning the other uh, protest. But, I mean, it, it just really speaks volume as far as like the, the control that the users have on that platform. Yeah, yeah, for you sure. Kind of like have the giant well, business decisions being like like that being made. All right, totally I, you know sense. what I'm going to do? I'm going to uh, this. I don't think this will record you guys, but I'm just going to do a brief, uh, a brief addendum. 
So right after the show ended, uh, we found out that Ellen Powell announced she is stepping down as Reddit CEO. Uh, she said she's resigning. She's not being fired. All of the uh, board members had nothing but nice things to say about her. And Reddit co-founder and original CEO Steve Huffman will be immediately taking over as CEO. I found this news out when Veronica Belmont messaged me on Slack and said, called it, more coming Monday on Daily Tech News Show. All right. I'm just putting that right in there. The new CEO of Reddit, Veronica Velma. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Steve I mean, Huffman. CEO of Reddit. That's kind of close. That's like you're basically one of the secretaries to the president of the internet, right? Yeah. You're, you're in the cabinet, I think. Hey, isn't... Uh, I might have wrong. Isn't... Uh, Drew Curtis's campaign manager didn't he used to wasn't he for, isn't he from Reddit or was he from Dig? Who is he? I don't I don't What's remember it? his name. Don't remember the name. Drew Curtis runs Fark. I should know this. Oh, I met some of the cool guys from Fark. I think it's rad that that thing is still going so strong. Fark was really kind to some brilliant news back in the late nineties. So I have a very soft spot in my my. Uh, heart. That's Drew Curtis, man. He's running I've for had... governor. I've had Fark sysadmins drive me to the airport from a hacker conference in Kentucky. So Fark is great, man. It's just running out of Drew's house. <laughs> Still. Yep. For yeah. real? Like the servers are in the basement? I believe so. I mean, it's it's so funny. I mean, he's. I think they are. Now he's running. The spirit for... of the '90s is alive <laughs> at Fark. In, 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 in Kentucky. someone's basement. Yeah. Yeah, I remember the first time I, I noticed a bunch of traffic coming in to a Subrilliant news story, and the referrer was Fark.com is how I found out about them. I was like, oh, where Fark, the hell is yeah. all this coming from? Love Fark. They've been good to me, too. Good people over there. That's a, that's a, ni that's a GeoCities Angel Fire era site that's still kicking. Yeah, Fark. Love and, and you know what? Hey, hang on. I think there's a really interesting analogy of, of that and uh, between that and Reddit, what we were just talking about. Yeah. You know, what's the difference here? What's the staying power? Huh. It's, I mean, the community is still, it's a very, still a very small community. Sure. But you think about the management of FARC in the sense that it's still run in the founder's basement. You know, is Reddit still running in the founder's basement? I doubt it. When co-founder co stepping back in, maybe he's like, hey, guys, I saw you guys were in some trouble. I've got a really big basement. <laughs> <laughs> Alexis Ohanian probably has a bigger basement than Huffman. But that said, yeah. uh, is it the size of the basement or the willingness to host from it that's important here? I, I think you got to keep it in the basement. <laughs> Just keep it in the basement, look. All Just right, keep folks? it in the basement. Don't. don't. <laughs> You're going to fark it up if you don't keep it in the basement. <laughs> there you go. Don't fark it up, people. Well, actually, no. You want to fark it up. You want to keep it fark. Oh, no. You want to. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Keep Let's fart it. things up. <laughs> it is, yes, it's your duty to the internet. Don't duty. fail us. Internet, don't fail me now. Mm. So what, yeah, think about it. Like what else from the era of FARC is still around? Amazon? Yes. Uh, eBay? Um, yeah, they're still relevant, I guess. PayPal? Ish. PayPal's PayPal, still it's not, is that really from that? They, I feel like PayPal is no, later. Totally from the, the mid-90s, aren't they? Are they? I'll tell you in a second. I could just be, like, wrong. <laughs> but oh, I, 1998. I, Never mind. Okay, that's well, they're, so that's why, I'm, that's why I was wishy-washy. Yeah, they, yeah I, I would say... They're coattail riders. This is the 95 and higher. PayPal, right? PayPal still counts, though. 90, I, I'd count PayPal. Sure. Well, well, wait a second. Well, when was Fark? Yeah, because I, I don't think Fark started more oh, than ninety seven. Oh, oh, what are we what are we thinking? Fark launched in ninety nine. Yeah. So okay. yeah. Okay. So, so the, no, the list so PayPal is counts. The pre two thousands. Right. I mean, technically, Google was pre two thousand, right? Yeah, that's a good point. But there's a lot of things that like just never really got off the ground before. Flues. <laughs> Flues didn't really get off the ground. Flues. No. Nope. 
What was it, wait, what was Flus? Was that the one where you could get gift cards for people? It was the online currency. Oh. Where you could oh. give them money and then they would allow you to spend it at select merchants. What? <laughs> so basically, yeah, it was online gift cards, but they that's didn't call insane. it that. Who would ever have a currency that's not tangible, you know? But see, the idea is eventually everyone will take flus. <laughs> yeah. Sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, that was a floozy idea to me. Webvan. Uh, Webvan's gone. Good riddance. Tripod is still around. They went B2B. Hey, Lycos is still around. but Lycos many, is reinventing okay, themselves as like a wearables company, I think. You, or you know what? Here's how you, you redefine this list. It has to be companies that have not changed hands. Well, yeah, because Excite is still around technically. Right. But, but yeah, how many I wouldn't times count that. Yeah, totally. I mean, wow.com, you know, internet.com. Zombocom. Zombocom has not sold out. No. Zombocom has not. You can still do anything at Zombocom. In fact, uh, Zombo.com was created in 1999. Oh, so it's right there in the FARC era. It's right there in the FARC era, yeah. I think, uh, you know, that, that uh, 95 to 2000 was really the, the heyday. When, where, what's Mahir up to? Is he working at Dynamo FM? <laughs> <laughs> Mahir in the mornings. Um, actually, DI.FM was December 99. Ah, look at that. When was yeah. Soma FM? Because I think that was pretty cool. Well, actually, it, didn't, it started as digitallyimported.com because .FM didn't exist yet. But, you know, right. it ended up getting DI.FM later. There has to be Never a list. Never say die. Please tell me somebody has compiled this list because I really want to see it. Like who's still around? Who survived? Yeah, it's basically the uh, VH1 Where Are They Now? Yeah. Of dot coms. Well, and, and it would take some legwork, but you could look at like all the registrations originated in that time period. And right, then... so let's just pull the WHOIS record and look at every domain registration from 1995 to 2000. And then, and then see like which ones with Alexa traffic to see if they were in the top one thousand. Which ones changed, went public, changed hands, etc. Mm. Actually, I bet the Alexa index has a wayback kind of feature, right? Oh well, that actually you could just use wayback. You're right. Well, but wayback won't tell you what the most popular sites were oh, I from guess that you're right. era. But Alexa might. Yeah. Oh, Alexa has a seven-day free trial now. What? I thought you used to just be able to pop in a site. You get. You used to be able to. <laughs> used to be able to do a. They're not like ZomboCom. You used to be able to do a lot of things in this world, Darren. No. See, see, it's when these businesses keep changing, right? And you right? expect you right? to be able to do anything, and then you and then you can't. They they took away the Zombo. They had I, Zombo. Now they don't. The thing about ZomboCom is they stayed true to their mission. Right. Letting you do anything you wanted. You don't let like it be in your mind. Like FARC. Yeah. Right. So they stayed true to their mission. An and also this started is... the Foobies site. But they mostly stayed true to their mission. What we need to do, Tom, is we need to create an award from the internet to the sites that have kept farking it up and kept to the Zombocom mission, right? So it's like and a the... lifetime achievement award. Well, not a lifetime, but yeah, you, it, we're coming up on uh, many, many years. On internet years. years, yeah. Yeah, we've, we've got 20 years, and I've been more alive online than offline. That's crazy. Um, mm. Mm. I'm, I, I'm counting my BPS days. Be for that to happen. Hey, man, yeah. you should totally, Tom, you should totally have Drew on your show. Uh, yeah, if he, would, if he would have time to do it, I'd love to do that. Yeah, I don't current know. current geek would be even better. But yeah, he could. I'd, I'd have him on anything he he wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. Let me. Um, I don't know. I'll I'll send him an email. All right. I'll introduce you to. He might remember it, me. He might not. I, have I no think idea. his um, I think his campaign manager used to used to be at Reddit. So I was looking it up. Five or six years, Darren. I will have been alive online longer than and not online. <laughs> okay. What do you count as as online? Like you're starting up your first email. Oh, I was going. Yeah, I was going from the first time I ever used Gopher. Mm. Yeah, I, BBSing. I BBSing for sure. 
For the first time my BBS, that was 92. Did you play Legend of the Red Dragon? No, I was just I was Go just connecting it. to a to a site called Ganja Mountain, which was local. Sure. And we just, you know, we would I would just it was like a message board, right? So we just like hang oh, out. Oh wait, no, I did the math wrong. Hold on. 92 is the same for me. That's 20 so 40. Oh, so next year Next, next year would be 20 next years? Year. Next, well, oh. it's 23. I've been online for 23 years. Next year, I will be 46. So oh. then I'll be half and half. So, so it's oh. like two. Almost it's as long. Your equilibrium point. Yeah. Yeah. Dang. Thank you, Super Eddie. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Great Wikipedia listing oh, here. Oh, nice. Internet properties established in 1984. Huh? I was established Whoa. in 1983, so that's something. Let's see. <laughs> there, was yeah, no, there were no internet properties established in my birth year. Whoa. There were some protocols, wow. though. About.com, 97. Wow. Right? Yeah. Oh, this is great. Still around. This is so good. Uh, Anantech, 97. Audible, AutoTrader. That's just the A's. Those are still around. <laughs> but then you get weird ones like Chow. 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 I love that site. Oh, oh yeah, that's the <laughs> cooking site that CNET bought. I don't know. Oh. Chow. You would think with the last name Kitchen, I would know the Chow website, but <laughs> Kitchen and Chow. Mm. CNET uh, bought a kitchen. The year store. I was born, the first uh, network to use random packet transmission was launched at the University of Hawaii. Huh? That's by oh, the year I was born. That, that was mean the year I was born. Random packet transmission. So you'll reach equilibrium. We went online the same year. We were born the same year. Yep. Glenn. Yep. We're like yep. internet brothers. That's right. Well, you know, it was one of those things. What was your first computer? A TI ninety nine four A. I had. God, I don't remember what I had. I, was, I had an eight. I know I had an eighty eighty eight. You had an eighty eighty eight. Yes. Nice. We're we're computer brothers. And that thing took so long to boot up. PCXT four point seven seven megahertz. I had CompuServe on that. I also had this Timex Sinclair 1000. Ah, uh, show off. <laughs> the TI-99 is not an easy reach. It's over there. I remember yeah. having conversations. Oh, I, just, I just had this Google Glass as a child. <laughs> <laughs> I remember asking so young. about modems, like buying modems. Uh, should I really buy this 14.4 modem? Will I really see an increase in speed? Yeah, you will. And, <laughs> and you can put your 9600 baud back in the box and take it back to the store you bought it from. I <laughs> jumped from... I jumped from... Files. I jumped from a 9600 baud to a 288. Ooh. I milked that 9600 baud. I was I was like, I don't need the graphical web. I what thought you were going to waste money on a 14.4 modem for just to see advertisements. And then finally, I gave in and I went right to 288. Yeah, I don't I, think I, I ever had 28. I had I went from 14 to 56. I don't think. Oh I ever wow! Had to yeah, nicely done. No, I, I was on a shell account. By. I was on a Unix shell. I, I browsed in Lynx until 1996. Yeah, Lynx was. Hey, have you ever thought to yourself, like when you when when everything was anonymous, like you didn't like there weren't public profiles of people and stuff. Have you ever thought about like if you've run into people that yeah. you used to like chat with years ago? Right. Like, what like happened on news to groups and stuff? Right. Yeah. Totally. What happened? I went to one at DefCon one year, uh, and it was somebody that I hung out with when I was like 12 on IRC, and. Um, I was like, holy crap, you're Mad Cow? I'm Mard Wolf. <laughs> like, whoa. Yeah, how do they even find, like, well, how, how do they, they find you? Pack 5. Oh, okay, right, right, right. Yeah. But I still yeah, remember, you know, like, would... all the IRC buddies I used to hang out with. I, I'm sure, you know, Nth Mike and BioCow and Nbomb and everybody else on IRC, like, is, is like, you have real relationships, right? Yeah. Then, oh, like, absolutely. Run into each other in meat space is totally bizarre. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. Like, I used to moderate a, <laughs> a reality show <laughs> board called Three Big Shows out of Canada, and I used to like I I I would just love to see like if there's anybody that, from that group that I could find. I don't even know. Like, no one even remembers it. I can't find anything about it online. You know, it was like this really small because the three big shows at the time were Survivor, Big Brother, and Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. <laughs> mm. So I was, like, running, I was, like, on that board, like, and, like, you know, it was a pretty decent-sized board, but I don't know anybody, like, I was just, you know, it would be cool to run into some people that remember, like, that I was the mod there, and I don't know, it was fun. 
It's cool. Good times, man. Online right. communities are real communities. Oh, yeah. And, and they, they can be can, good. They could be bad, right? Yeah. They can keep farking on, or they can oust CEOs. That's right. Well, uh, that's all. You all... Think about it. That's all. Twitter is is a big is a big BBS, really. Kind of. Uh, my BBS let you post more than 140 characters. Yeah, but, but you know what I'm saying. It's the it's the I chat know. board, right? I know. I know. Let's reinvent the chat room over and over. We will continue <laughs> to reinvent IRC, FTP. And www until the end of time. I was just, I'm sorry, I was just looking at the fact that Philip K. Dick's daughter attended the Man in the High Castle panel at San Diego Comic Con. What's this? Let's do it. You ready? What are we I'm doing? So we're going to call it. We're, we're going to call, we're going to, well, we're going to have to find out about sports, obviously. Sports? Yes. Len? Len and sports? Yeah, what about it? Yeah, come on, Tom. You're the anchor of this thing. You should know. Uh, oh. Now to Len with sports. Oh, yeah. Well, the Cavs just signed uh, LeBron James today, bringing the big three back together, Kyrie Irving, Kevin Love earlier this week, and, uh, and LeBron James. Also, uh, this is just Cleveland sports because I don't know anything else. I'm not really following anybody else. And uh, who else? Iman Shumpert was signed this week. So the one holdout is J.R. Smith. What's going to happen with him? Who knows? But there's unfinished business, there's unfinished business in Cleveland, and it looks like Dan Gilbert is getting this team back together. <laughs> well, we can hope so, Len. <laughs> Thanks for that. Len will be back with more updates at 1030. Now to Darren with weather. Uh, the weather on the network here at the Hack 5 Warehouse not looking so great. Send in pings to my favorite 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. Usually using about 32 bytes here, but uh, somewhat uh, truncated them to uh, three time to live. They're not really making it past the gateway at this time. It's, it's rather sad. I think the bits are just falling on the floor. Um, Hopefully the networks run much smoother in your area. Oh, you, I'll be taking my umbrella, Darren. That's it for Eyewitness Tech News, everybody. Have a good afternoon.